video review. Sorry for the boring introduction today. The last one took a lot out of me. But I promise there will be more in the future. For this unit review, we are going to be taking a look at Unit 3, which is Sensation and Perception. We're going to start off by taking a look at some of the principles of sensation and how we take in information from the outside environment. From there, we'll move on to principles of perception, where we will see how our brain organizes and interprets this sensory stimuli. Then we're going to finish off by learning about some of the key facts and anatomical figures of the human senses. I am so sorry to have to do this to you again, but as always, remember to have your review guide in hand. As you're watching the video, be sure to fill out everything you need. Before we get into the specifics, let's take a look at some basic terms that will help us understand what we're about to learn about. Sensation is just going to be the process of detecting physical stimulus such as light, sound, or pressure, while perception is just going to be how our brain integrates and organizes all of this sensory stimuli in order to make sense of it. Transduction is going to be the transforming of outside stimuli into neural impulses. Each sense is going to have a specialized receptor site that is responsible for turning sensory information into neural impulses through transduction that the brain can comprehend. Psychophysics is going to be the study of how physical energy can relate to our psychological experiences. Psychophysics centers around the idea of sensory thresholds. When talking about sensory thresholds, it is very important to distinguish between both absolute threshold and difference thresholds. The absolute threshold is just going to be the smallest possible strength of a stimulus that can be detected half the time. This is true for any of our senses. Let's say we're testing the absolute threshold of sound. Remember when you had to get your hearing tested when you were younger? You would have to put on those noise canceling headphones and the nurse would play a little tone in each ear at different levels. It is possible that they were testing the absolute threshold of your hearing, trying to find a tone and pitch where you were only detecting it 50% of the time. The graph on the board here represents absolute thresholds. Information that is outside of the box is considered supraliminal, meaning we are consciously aware of this sensory information because we have enough time to perceive it. While sensory information inside of the box is considered subliminal, meaning we cannot consciously perceive it. Generally seen as an unethical marketing tactic, I actually placed two subliminal messages in this video. As you can see by our two messages on the boards, to be fair though, I think it was a pretty good message to pass along. Sensory systems provide each organism with the ability to obtain the proper sensory information that pertains to each organism's use for that sensory information. If you had not noticed yet, the absolute threshold only deals with one stimulus. Well, what happens when we compare change in two stimuli? That is where the concept of difference threshold comes in. The difference threshold is just going to be the smallest possible change that we can detect between two stimuli 50% of the time. The difference threshold is also referred to as the just noticeable difference or the JND. A simple example that I like to use to explain the difference threshold is for you to imagine you are holding a rock that weighs five pounds. Now imagine that I take a rock that weighs half a pound and I place that on top. Chances are you will notice a slight change in weight. Now imagine you're holding a 50 pound rock and I place that same half pound rock on top of it. Chances are you won't notice much of a change in weight. This is because the size of the just noticeable difference will always vary depending on its relationship to the original stimulus. This is known as Weber's Law. Another way of looking at this could be a musician having to fine tune their instrument to the exact specification to produce a certain sound. Now for this next principle, I am going to let you in on a little secret. Since the start of this video, I have changed my hat, my sweatshirt, and my pants. I even put these glasses on for the fun of it. Here on the TV screen, you can see me from the beginning of the video. Now, if you didn't pick up on these changes, it is okay. Nothing is wrong with you. This is just the whole idea of selective attention. Selective attention is just going to be focusing our conscious awareness on a specific stimulus while ignoring outside stimuli. The signal detection theory is just going to state that the detection of a stimulus is going to depend on two things. One, the intensity of the stimulus, and two, the physical and psychological state of the individual. To provide an example of this theory, I will give you two scenarios. Scenario one, I want you to imagine you're walking to a car in an empty, dull, lit parking lot. Scenario two is going to be fairly similar. It's gonna be the same parking lot, but instead of being dull, lit, and at night, now we're going to be walking through it in the middle of a bright sunny day. Chances are in scenario one, you'll be more susceptible to picking up on different stimuli, like the leaves scraping on the ground or the trees swaying in the wind. The reason being at night, you're generally in more of an alert and aware state, making it easier for you to detect some of the stimuli. The cocktail party effect is just going to be our brain's ability to focus our auditory attention on a particular stimulus while filtering out a range of other stimuli. When you're at a loud party, you're still able 
able to understand someone next to you telling you a story, even with the sound of the music and dozens of other people yelling. Another principle of sensation that we need to talk about is sensory adaptation. Have you ever walked into someone's house for the first time and upon entering, it just smells absolutely awful and you just wonder how in the world this person lives like this? Well, chances are they've adapted to this sense. Sensory adaptation is just a decreased responsiveness to a particular stimulus due to constant stimulation. Another example of sensory adaptation would be not feeling your watch on your wrist or not feeling a piece of jewelry you've been wearing all day. Now let's move on to principles of perception. I'm sure you have all heard the phrase, seeing is believing before. What you may not have been aware of is the fact that the opposite, believing is seeing, also holds true. Our experience, assumptions, and expectations can lead to a perceptual set. A perceptual set is just a mental predisposition to see one thing and not the other. When looking at this image, what do you see? <coughs> Did you see a duck? Or how about a rabbit? Well, chances are you first saw a duck, seeing as how I did play the as soon as the picture popped up. Even though this image can be seen in multiple ways, chances are because of the duck sound, you first perceived it as a duck. In 1972, a British newspaper published undisputable proof of the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. Accompanied with the headlines of undisputable proof, the corresponding image over here does appear to look like old Nessie. Perceptual sets generally form as a result of our schemas or organized clusters of information. Another concept of perceptual interpretation is the context effect. The context effects can oftentimes explain how cultural bias can influence our perception. When this image was shown in a cross-cultural study, those questioned from East Africa believed that it was a group under a tree and the woman had a metal box on her head. While Westerners perceived this family being inside and not a metal box on the woman's head, but a window above her head. Bottom-up processing is going to be data-driven processing. It refers to the flow of sensory data from the sensory receptors to the brain. Top-down processing is going to be guided by higher level cognitive processes. When using top-down processing, we are relying on our past experiences and our expectations. When you look at the picture that I just presented on the board, bottom-up processing allows you to pick up on all the lines and colors that form my corgi, Stark. Top-down processing will allow you to draw upon your experiences. Corgis are a fairly common dog, so you may have used your past experiences of seeing a corgi or even a dog before to come to the conclusion that you were looking at a dog. You may have also come to another conclusion about my dog's weight and I understand he's on a diet. In the early 20th century, Max Oberthimer, Kurt Kafka, and Wolfgang Kohler all made contributions to the foundation of Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology focuses on the idea that our mind organizes sensations and perceptions into meaningful patterns or forms. A Gestalt is just going to be considered an organized whole. Gestalt psychology emphasizes our tendency to integrate pieces of information into meaningful wholes. In form perception, the main idea we want to focus on is the idea behind figure-ground relationship. The figure-ground relationship basically states that what we are currently looking at, we will perceive that object as a visual field, which would be considered the figure. And this stands out from all other objects, which would be considered the ground. This whole figure-ground relationship continuously reverses as you change your focus on different objects. This can be seen in certain illusions such as the glass picture. Is this a cup or two people staring each other down? It all depends on what you perceive as the foreground and what you perceive as the background. I for one see a cup every single time. Once we perceive our figure from our background, we now have to organize this information in meaningful ways. This can be done through proximity, which is just when we group nearby figures together. Looking at our image, I like to look at it as people eating lunch together at a table. If each circle was a person, chances are we would probably assume that these six were in one group, and these six were in another group as a result of their proximity with one another. Similarity is just going to be that when figures are similar to one another, we usually group them together. In this image here, we see black and white horizontal lines instead of vertical lines. Good continuation is when we perceive smooth, continuous patterns rather than discontinuous ones. Closure is going to be when we fill in the gaps to create a complete whole object. In our image here, our brain is filling in the gaps in order for us to see the cube. Depth perception is going to allow us to see objects in 3D space space even though our retinal images are all two dimension. Depth perception will also help us with judging distance. Research on the visual cliff study revealed that many species perceive the world in three dimensions at or very soon after birth. We use different binocular and monocular cues in order to transform 2D sensations into 3D perceptions. Monocular cues are depth cues that we can perceive using either eye alone. Binocular cues are going to be depth cues that require the use of both eyes. We are going to be taking a look at eight different monocular 
binocular cues by identifying them in this picture. So as always, it's virtual. Let's go inside the picture. So here we are in this cool desert mountain region. Let's identify some monocular cues. Interposition is just going to be when one object blocks out or overlaps a view of the other, we perceive that object to be closer up. In our scene here, interposition can be shown by the little mountain or hill right here in the middle of the picture. It is blocking or overlapping a larger mountain in the background, so we know that it is closer to us. Relative size is when we assume that two objects that are similar in size, we perceive the one that casts a larger retinal image to be closer up. In our scene, you can look at some of the vegetation. We assume that these two bushes are fairly similar, so the one that casts a larger retinal image, we will perceive as being closer. Relative clarity centers around the idea Idea that since light coming from distant objects has to pass through more of an atmospheric field, we perceive hazy or less clear objects as further away. Our sensory data from the mountains in the background show them as faded or less detailed. As a result of relative clarity, we perceive these mountains as further away. On the other hand, texture gradient is going to refer to how we perceive objects as closer up with more detail. Those with less detail, we perceive as further away. In our scene, we see a lot more detail in the grass further up in this section than we do further back in the picture in this section. Relative height is is just when we perceive objects higher in our field of vision as further away. No good example here in our scene, so I'm just gonna have to add in two cactuses. Cacti, cacti, I'm going with cactuses. These two cactuses relay the same exact retinal image, but we tend to perceive cactus number two as further away because it is higher in our field of vision. Linear perspective is when parallel lines, such as a road or railroad tracks, which I guess I'm going to have to edit in now because I did not plan ahead when choosing this picture out, appear to converge with distance. As the railroad tracks go further into the distance, they appear that they are going to meet up at one point. Our perception allows us to understand that they're not actually going to touch, but it just means they're getting further and further away. Light and shadow also help us in perceiving distance. Generally speaking, objects closer up reflect more light. So given two similar objects, the one that is dimmer, we will perceive to be further away. Relative motion or motion parallax states that the nearer an object, the faster it will appear to move. It explains why a plane flying 700 miles per hour, 30,000 feet in the air, appears to be moving slow, while a car driving 25 miles per hour right by you appears to be moving much quicker. So that's it for all of our monocular cues. Let's head back to the classroom. As I mentioned earlier, binocular cues are going to be depth cues that are used by both of our eyes. Retinal disparity states that the greater in difference between two retinal images, the closer the object is to the viewer. The principle of retinal disparity can be shown by holding two fingers like this and staring at both your fingers. You start to see like a little finger floating in the middle. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. I think it's called a finger sausage. Nasty. Convergence is going to refer to the extent at which our eyes converge or eye muscles rotate when looking at an object. The brain is actually taking notes of the angle of convergence while perceiving retinal images. Perceptual constancies are going to refer to the idea that objects are constant and unchanging despite changes in their sensory input. Size constancy states that the perception of an object as maintaining the same size despite changing images on the retina. While shape constancy states that the perception of an object as maintaining the same shape despite changing images on the retina. Now that we are experts on the principles of sensation and perception, now it's time to take a look at just how our senses work. When light waves first enter your eye, they pass through the cornea, pupil, lens, and iris. The cornea helps gather and direct incoming light. The pupil is going to be the black area of the eye, while the iris is the eye color. So when someone says you have brown eyes or blue eyes or green eyes, they are referring to your iris. The lens can thicken or become thinner to bend the focus of incoming light. The information is then passed along to the retina. In the retina, millions of sensory receptor sites called rods and cones are hard at work. These specific sensory receptors are oftentimes referred to as photoreceptors. Rods help process black, white, and gray and are necessary for peripheral and light vision while cones detect fine detail and are responsible for color vision. Within our retina, we also have our ganglion cells and our bipolar cells. Preliminary processing of visual information starts with the ganglion cells. However, with only about a million ganglion cells and over 130 million photoreceptor cells, it's tough work for the ganglion cells to process all this information. Bipolar cells are going to collect information from the photoreceptors 
and funnel them into our ganglion cells. This visual information is then sent to the thalamus where it is redirected to the occipital lobe for further processing. Two major theories explain our perception of color. The trichromatic theory states that the eye has three color receptors, one sensitive to red, one sensitive to blue, and one sensitive to green. When these receptors are stimulated, we can produce any combination of color. The opponent process theory states that opposing retinal processes, our color pairs being blue and yellow, red and green, and white and black. So what this means is some cells are stimulated by red, then inhibited by green, or stimulated by yellow and inhibited by blue. So when you're looking at a red apple, none of that Granny Smith nonsense, the green photoreceptors in your eyes are being inhibited while the red photoreceptors are being excited. This allows us to perceive red. Now we're gonna try and test out the opponent process theory a bit. In just a second, I'm going to project an image on the screen for about 30 seconds. What I want you to do is stare at the dot, which will be our focal point. Do your best to stare at this dot for the entirety of the 30 seconds. You can blink if you have to, but you might get better results if you don't. Once the 30 seconds is over, the image is going to disappear and I still want you to stare at the dot. So we're gonna switch over to the image right now. Have fun. So you may have noticed that after the image disappeared, you actually saw the reverse colors of that image. What you saw was an after image, which is just a visual experience that occurs after the original source of stimulation is no longer present. When dealing with sight, we do have a few common sensory disorders. Nearsightedness is when our eyeballs are a little too long or the cornea becomes too steeply curved. This results in the light entering the eye to not come to a clear focus point on the retina. This makes it harder to clearly see objects further away. Farsightedness occurs when the cornea projects the focal point of visual information behind the retina. This leads to trouble clearly seeing nearby objects. Color blindness, while not technically a form of blindness, occurs when someone is unable to see color in a normal way. Now on to hearing. Sound waves are going to be collected by the outer ear, amplified by the middle ear, and transduced in the inner ear. The outer ear includes the eardrum, which is a tightly stretched membrane at the end of the ear canal that vibrates when hit by sound waves. The eardrum is going to separate the outer ear from the middle ear. As I mentioned earlier, it is the duty of the middle ear to amplify sound waves. After amplification occurs, the sound waves travel through the oval window of the ear into the inner ear structure called the cochlea. The cochlea contains the basilar membrane, which is where our sensory receptors for hearing are located. These sensory receptor cells are known as our hair cells. Transduction occurs as our sensory neurons take the auditory information to the thalamus, where it is then redirected to the temporal lobe. The frequency theory states that the rate of the nerve impulse traveling along the auditory nerve matches the frequency of tone, allowing us to distinguish pitch. While the place theory is going to say that we perceive pitch because the brain can pick up on the area of the basilar membrane where it receives neural messages. Conductive hearing loss occurs when there is a problem conducting sounds anywhere along the route through the outer or middle ear. Sensory neural hearing loss occurs when there is damage to the inner ear or to the nerve from the ear to the brain. Mixed hearing loss is just going to be any combination of conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss. Smell is going to be a chemical sense, but there is not really a basic sensation for smell as there is for hearing and vision. Instead, there are over 5 million olfactory cells with their thousands of different receptor proteins that recognize each individual odor molecule. Some odors even trigger a combustion of receptors. Unlike other senses, your sense of smell or olfaction bypasses the thalamus and goes directly to the olfactory cortex of the brain. Some information is then sent to the hypothalamus, which explains why smell can be associated with different memories or emotions. The rest of this information is then sent to its home in the primary olfactory cortex, where fine distinctions are made between the odors. Taste or gestation is also going to be a chemical sense and is technically four senses in one. Taste is processed by our taste buds, which are gonna be our sensory receptors for taste. The main human tastes are gonna be sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami refers to a savory taste and is a characteristic of broth and meats as a result of its high level of glutamate. 
I'm sure you've always heard, if you can't smell, you can't taste, and this is partially true. While individuals can tell the difference between things such as bitter and sour, it's the aroma associated with the taste that plays a huge role in sensing taste. I also think it is a great time to break this myth right here. Right there, that is a huge old lie. If anyone has ever taught you this to be truth, shame, shame on them. Shame. shame. Just like taste, our sense of touch is actually multiple senses in one. With touch, we experience pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. These can be combined with one another to create other sensations such as hot or cold. Pain is the unpleasant sensation of physical discomfort. Nose receptors are our sensory receptor site for our sense of pain. One theory of pain states that a gate in the spinal cord either opens to permit pain signals traveling up small nerve fibers to reach the brain or closes to prevent their passage. Because pain is both physical and psychological, it can often be controlled through both physical and psychological means. Think back to a time you were hurt and someone instructed you to take deep breaths. Oftentimes, a simple act such as this relaxes the autonomic nervous system and can relieve some of the physical symptoms of pain. We also have two lesser known senses that help monitor our body's position and movement. Our kinesthetic sense allows us to be aware of where our body parts are in relation to one another. Propri receptors are sensory receptors located in the muscles and joints that provide information about body position and movement. This sense allows us to reach out for our drink, bring it to our mouth, take a sip without spilling it all over ourselves. The major brain area associated with our kinesthetic sense is the cerebellum. Our vestibular sense is responsible for our head and body's position and movement, allowing us to maintain proper balance while walking and standing. Vestibular sacs located in the ear respond to gravity to encode information about the head's orientation. Vertigo is a sudden internal or external spinning sensation, often triggered by moving your head too quickly. It can be caused by several underlying issues but what's going on here is that the semicircular canals in the inner ear are being disrupted. This leads to that feeling of spinning. Something as simple as spinning around very quickly and suddenly stopping can lead to a brief case of vertigo because the semicircular canals take a bit of time to reach its neutral state. Now that wraps up our Unit 3 review. Remember to check out the review section in your packet at the end of each unit review just to make sure you're understanding everything from the videos. And with that, I'm out of here. See you next time for our Unit 4 video review on learning. Peace.